Thank you very much for joining us today as we continue our 2022 series of all virtual NLM history talks. And to those of you on Twitter, thank you for following along using the hashtag NLM Hist Talk. NLM History Talks promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the NLM to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. It also reflects our commitment to foreground the voices of people of color, women, and individuals of a variety of cultural and disciplinary backgrounds who value these collections and use them to advance their research, their teaching, and their learning. We supplement NLM History Talks with speaker interviews on our blog called Circulating Now, located at circulatingnow.nlm.nih.gov. And I'll add that NLM History Talks are made possible by an outstanding team here at the National Library of Medicine and at NIH Videocasting. And I wanna thank each and every one of them for their time and their talent in bringing this program to you, the public. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to call your attention to our next NLM History Talk to be offered by Dr. Rana Hogarth, Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Join us on Thursday, April 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern time to hear Dr. Hogarth speak on the measure of black unfitness legacies of slavery in the early eugenics movement. I'd also like to call your attention at this moment to the live feedback button under the video stream that you're watching. Please use this feature to send questions to me and I will share them with our speaker during the uh, Q&A following today's talk. Thank you. So now I have the great pleasure and privilege of introducing Dr. Patricia Palma, Assistant Professor in the Department of Historical and Geographic Sciences at the University of Tarapacá and Erica Chile. Dr. Palma holds her doctorate in Latin American history from the University of California, Davis, and she is a specialist in the history of medicine in Peru, focusing on the circulation and consumption of non-Western medicine in the country. She is a member of the Peruvian Association of History of Science, Technology, and Health, and she has published a number of articles and chapters about Chinese medicine, homeopathy, and hypnosis in Peru. These include contributions to the Journal of Evolutionary Studies in Business, Revista de Historia, Salud Colectiva, and the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Latin American History, among many others. Her current project studies the presence of, Chinese, of the Chinese diaspora in Peru and the north of Chile, stressing the relationship between unwanted immigrants and epidemics. So I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Palma to the National Library of Medicine, albeit virtually, to speak on George Deacon and the circulation of homeopathic therapies in Peru 1880 to 1915. So Dr. Palma, a warm welcome to you and thank you very much for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Good afternoon from Chile. Uh, I would like to start by specifically thank you, Jeff Resnick for the Chief of History of Medicine Division of the National Library of Medicine, reminding the public that the library holds important resources on Latin American history of medicine. Today, I will present about homeopathy in Peru, focusing on the Dr. George Deacon and his journal, La Homeopathia, available in the NLH. This presentation is part of a paper that I published in 2019 in the Brazilian journal, Historia Ciencio Saúde Manguinhos. In February, in February of 1896, 1896, the Medical Century, the American Journal of Homeopathy, Medicine and Surgery, published an enthusiastic letter from the former student of the Pulte Medical College in Ohio, announcing the triumph of the global practice of homeopathy. George Deacon, a Peruvian American homeopath who settled down in Peru in the 1880s, reported that after a long battle with the local physicians, the Peruvian Congress had allowed homeopaths to practice medicine in the country without supervision of the School of Medicine of Lima. I quote, it has been a labor of many years, as you know, a, a struggle of one man against a hundred, informed Dr. Deacon. This strong of an obscure David against the Goliaths 
was a result of the almost 10 years of legal battles between deacon and doctor from the School of Medicine of Lima, during which professional doctor sought to discredit home of homeopathy and its practitioners. The ruling threatened the School of Medicine's attempt to monopolize medical practice and result in the school's conflict between this institution and the Congress, claiming that representatives have undermined their authorities. By the time readers learn about this strange victory in a distant country in South America, homeopathy was a medical knowledge among a vast repertoire of medical therapies, which comprise of emergent professional medicines, Chinese herbalists, and indigenous practitioners. While doctors from the School of Medicine rejected this methodology and remained hostile to homeopaths like Dr. Deacon, elites demand the therapy as a triumph of modernity and therefore began to use these medicinal products. Lima's educated and well-traveled elite knew that in civilized countries hosted many practitioners and even a school of homeopathic medicine, a hope that Peru follow, would follow suit. For them, homeopaths were the symbol of the progress and modernization of Peru required. In this talk, I examine the circulation of the use of homeopathy medical therapies and medicine in Lima following the professional trajectory of George Deacon since his initial medical practice in the 1880s until his death in 1950. I state that despite the reduced number of homeopath practicing in, the, in this country, this heal system occupied a central role in the medicinal marketplace, a consumer space where patients found a diversity of medical practitioners and products. Because of the intense trade between the United States and Peru, patients and practitioners could acquire, use, and recommend homeopathic treatment. In the public space, George Deacon undermined the position of the School of Medicine of Lima and professional medicine in the country. A, de a decade of the debates about the status of homeopathy deepened on the conflicts between various members of the state who had conflicted perspective of public health and the role of homeopathy should play there. This presentation will be divided in two parts. The part one analyzes the trajectory of George Deacon, the responsible of introduce, introducing the discussion of the right of homeopathic physician into the public sphere in Peru. Most importantly, he was the only alternative medical practitioner that placed the debate about the relevance of medical pluralism and the need to break the suffocating monopoly of the School of Medicine in the Peruvian Congress. I'll also take a look at the debates between the supporter and detractor of homeopathy in the Peruvian Congress during 1880s and 1990s. Finally, I explored the circulation of homeopathic kits and medicine in the late 19th century. Every year, hundreds of homeopathic kits and manuals were imported from the United States enable people to treat family and community members in an informal practice following the guideline of American homeopaths. To trace these stories, I analyzed the introduction of the such product in the local market and the publicity that fostered this consumption. At the, eighth of the, at the end of the 18th century, the German physician Samuel Hahnemann developed a field of experimental pharmacology stating the principle of the simil, similibus curanturs, or like cures like. In other words, disease could be cured by the administration of remedies that produce effects similar to those of the disease. The German doctor followed the law of the similar, called his, this heal system homeopathy from the Greek from like, 
and suffering while referring to the institutional Western medicine as allopathy or Greek, from the Greek from allied and suffering. In Latin America, the use of, of homeopathic dates back to the war in the dependence. In, 18, in 1817, the revolutionary General Jose de San Martin crossed the Andes and this carrying his own homeopathic kit that a friend of him brought from Europe. It only took a few years from homeopathy become a component of the medical plural healthcare, the plural healthcare system in several countries of Latin America. In Peru, the origins of homeopathy are still buried, in part because his historians of medicine have paid little attention to non-institutional and non-Western form of medical therapies. Homeopathy arrived in Peru in the 1980s, thanks to the Peruvian American homeopath, George Deacon. The personal information of George or Jorge Deacon is a scare, but records show that he was born in Paita, Peru, of the marriage of a local woman, an American Marine. In the 1870s, Deacon moved to Ohio, where he earned a degree in homeopathy and the Pulte Medical College at the age 22 in 1877. Upon gra graduating from the university, George Deacon moved to Lima and began his homeopathic practice, placing a name plate outside his door and taking, taking out a newspaper as a local doctor did. After some years practicing in the country, Deacon decided to edit edit a journal in order to expand the knowledge of homeopathy. In August 1888, La Crónica Médica, the most important medical pub publication in Peru at that time, announced the publication of the homeopathy, whose goal was, quote, to disseminate Hahnemann's doctrine in the country. The number of printed copies or subscriber is unknown, but the magazine developed exchange with the most important medical journals in Lima and Deacon sent copy to the Army Medical Library in the US. Ironically, one of these was the Chronica Medica, a journal that represented the discourse of the allopaths regular doctor and included articles criticizing homeopaths, especially Dr. Deacon. The precise numbers of Homeopaths practiced in Lima during the 19th century is uncertain, and in document of the School of Medicine and debate in the Congress, it's only possible to identify the name of George Deacon. The School of Medicine rapidly responded to the increased visibility and popularity of homeopathy, asking health authority in the municipality of Lima to prohibit Deacon from practicing medicine in the country. During the mid 19th century, the School of Medicine of Lima, also known as San Fernando, became an exceptional institution in Latin America and it was Peru's only medical training facility until 1961. The school had an immense power for being responsible for multiple areas of the public health in absence of the Ministry of Health created only in 1935. The school not only granted professional academic degrees, but also oversaw public health, authorized foreign doctor to practice medicine in Peru and monitored the opening and ruling pharmacies in the early 20th century. Clearly, the dean and the doctor assembled in the School of Medicine exercised an important amount of power and influence upon the state. Using this influence, the School of Medicine devoted tremendous energy toward persecuting no licensed healers. It is possible to observe in a discussion inside the School of Medicine, Dr. Dean, the medical therapist of sight, the field of Western medicine as simple quackery. Therefore, they argued it was necessary to prohibit their practice. In 1884, the mayor of Lima, through the Office of Hygienic Inspector, 
shut down Deacon's practice because he didn't hold a degree granted or recognized by the School of Medicine. This episode initiated a legal battle that would last 10 years. Deacon litigated in defending the freedom of practice of a different model of medical treatment, as well as the patient's freedom to use it. The municipal resolution was a response to several reports presented by Dr. Manuel Odriazola, the Dean of the School of Medicine, and Dr. Darío Torres, the Hygienic Inspector of Lima. Both authorities pointed out that, according to the Article 132 of the Education Law, Deacon should have been taken the med medicinal exam in the School of Medicine before practice any medical therapy. Deacon counter argued that its legislation was fair and prudent, but ap applicable only to people who practice under the allopathic system. He explained that the legislation would not include homeopathic medicine because when political authorities approved the law in 1856, the practice was unknown in the country. Finally, he stated that allopathic and homeopathic medicine were in distinct healing system and therefore the School of Medicine did not have any authority to assess, his, assess this knowledge and aptitude in homeopathy. Finally, in October of 1884, the mayor of Lima decreed that Deacon had no right to, to practice his profession unless he submitted the examination that established in the regulation of the School of Medicine. As a result, the municipality of Lima informed Deacon he had to remove the plate outside his house and cease his advertisement in the press. In addition, the Office of Statistics refused to receive that certificate from Dr. Deacon. In the meanwhile, Dr. Deacon continued practicing in Lima, for which the mayor or ordered the chief of police to impose a 10 pesos fine for the infringement. A, a, a year later, in 1885, Deacon published a text encourage the Legislative Assembly to pass a law to protect homeopathic practitioners who, in his work, embodied the progress of the science. Several months later, Deacon obtained his first legal victory when Prosecutor Cardenas ruled that homeopathic medicine did not oppose, quote, moral and public security and that everyone had the right to freely choose their medical system. Cardenas concluded that Deacon only need to pay for this commercial license and then he could practice in the country. With this favorable legal opinion, Deacon once again filled the exception from the School of Medicine examination. This time, his request, which had been rejected by the municipality of Lima, the School of Medicine and the Judicial Branch found itself before a new judge, the Peruvian Congress. In 1886, the Commission of Instruction of the Ministry of Justice decided that the case was beyond their jurisdiction and asked Deacon to submit his request to the Congress, the only institution that could grant exception. In 1887, Prosecutor Bueno issued a new, a new decision there was no reason to make exception for Deacon, but he has the right to bring the discussion to the legislative power, which moved the discussion to another area to rule. In the meantime, cross Congress defined the legal status of homeopathy in the country, and Deacon employed two strategies to overcome the obstacles imposed by the San Fernando against the practice and the publicity of his work. The, def the diffusion of the homeopathy, homeopathy ideas, ideas in a space not controlled or influenced by the School of Medicine through the publication of the newspaper La Myopatia, and the support of import important members of the Congress and the judicial system. Homeopaths around the world, around the world 
So legal recognition of their teaching and practices independently from allopathic medicines. To do this, they used to, to use they used to diverse strategy to legitimize and institutionalize this medical therapy. The most important by the creation of associations and publication of specialized journals. During the second half of the 19th century in Latin America, various associations emerged in Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil. While Peru lacked an association, the newspaper La Myopatia allowed Deacon to promote the circulation of homeopathic ideas in the country. Deacon relied especially on this newspaper to defend homeopathy and to share information about its practice this practice worldwide. In an, in, in an editorial of September 1887, Deacon state that because allopathic doctor could, could not stop the conversions of physician to homeopathy, these enemies decide to spread false claim about this therapy. According to Deacon, local physician deceive and scare patient by saying that the homeopathy medical products a small spherical piece, pills of compressed sugar called globules were poisonous. Paradoxically, the same doctor moved these products, suggesting they were nothing but placebos. Deacon claimed that he reckless allopathic treatment were the real threat to the health of patients. Like many other disciplines of Hahnemann, George Deacon lashed lash out against physicians for their remedies and treatment. He argued that medicinal instruments were a form of, quote, modern medical vampires that will horrify our descendants, referring to the massive use of allopathic doctor in this time of needles, vesicants, and leeches. He also pointed out that allopathic treatment had higher mortality rate than homeopathy. Deacon used cholera, a disease, a disease common in Chile and Peru, to exemplify that, quote, the mortality rate of those treated allopathically was 50%, while those treated homeopathically was only 9%. While this number may be exaggerated, the idea that allopathic treatment had higher rates of mortality coincide with the formation of the American homeopath and the United States Life Insurance Company. For instance, in 1870, the Albany Life Insurance Company of New York gave a 10% discount to those members who use homeopathy. According to its own statistic, 4.17 person of every hundred died after receiving homeopathic treatment. Instead, 13.53 died under allopathic method. For obvious reason, regular medical doctor ignored this statistic. To bluster the reputation of homeopathy, Deacon emphasized news and its use and practice in civilized countries from Europe and North America. He even discussed in homeopathy in Chile, the country that defeated Peru in a recent war. Perhaps Deacon used this to encourage local readers to spread on homeopathy by acknowledging that the rival nation have already, already, already embraced it. The second strategy Deacon used to use was Deacon used it to obtain support of important members of the was to obtain important support of members of the Congress and the judicial system. Through the circulation of his newspaper, Deacon built network with important members of the regional and dominion elite, including congressmen and judge who offered their support to his practice. In 1886, for example, two years after the prohibition of the School of Medicine, an editorial in the Chronica Medica reported that Deacon still insisted on healing people. Unlike the previous case, in this time, he counted on the support of an influential judge in Peru. 
the Jewish Cardinal wrote a report defending the rights to practice, basing his defense on the freedom of the industry and the freedom of the patient to seek healing from whatever they wish, stating a very liberal discourse of this time. Arguments of Mr. Cardenas and other supporters play a pivotal role in the Congress discussion of Deacon's case. Supporting of homeopathy in the Congress responded to the argument contending that the debate should not be about if the homeopathy worked or not, but to secure freedom and tolerance of science above all. Several congressmen agreed that the disciples of Hahnemann did not infringe the moral order or the preservation of the public health, and that from a strict constitutional interpretation of the law, there was no reason to prohibit the, this profession. But if they, if they did not accept the regulation of the homeopathy by a special law, the School of Medicine will retain the monopoly of public health, a deeply anti-liberal idea for politicians. Many supporters of a special status of homeopathy believe that guaranteeing professional freedom will attract more white immigrants to the country. One of the primary ideas of the positivists was that American and European immigration would lead to the progress and modernization through racial and cultural improvement. Peruvian intellectual and politician were willing to increase civil liberties such as religion, freedom to attract immigrants. From this approach, limiting the freedom of homeopathy would scare off possible European or American immigrants. A significant number of representatives was not particularly interested in increasing medical pluralism by allowing the practice of home, by, uh, by allowing the practice of homeopathy. Instead, they saw the potential of attracting desirable immigrants. Supporter of George Deacon argued that in a context of medical practitioners shortage the School of Medicine should be more flexible, especially with foreign doctors with a medical degree. As Deacon argued, statistics about birth rate and mortality in Lima show that two thirds of the population in 1885 perished without medical assistance. The social and medical problem was even worse in town and small village where few doctors were available and patients lacked monetary resources to pay for medical service. According to Prosecutor Cardenas, posing a law that limited the number of practitioners with such as the scarcity of doctors will be a despotic mockery to the country. For several representatives, it was incomprehensible to reject George Deacon's medical degree for a foreign university when the country needs more doctors willing to provide free or low cost medicine to the poorest citizens. To some representative, a degree from a university in the United States was sufficient evidence of professional qualification to practice medicine in the country. Professional doctors mainly criticized both the Congress and the government for getting involved in issues that they consider to be out of their jurisdiction. Doctors who train in the School of Medicine defended their monopoly of medical knowledge, considering that the only, only this group have the capacity to deliberate topics regarding to any medical issues. In the Senate debate in 1892, Dr. Van Baren argued that the request was a scientific issue. And because neither the Commission of Introduction nor the Congress was a scientific body, they could not resolve the case. Despite of these efforts, finally, in 1895, in 18, in Pope Chambers ruled to allow Deacon to practice in the country via a legal resolution issued in October 1897. Deacon came to, to be a symbol of the modernization that the country needed. 
archival records suggest that Deacon practiced medicine in Peru at least until 1912, the last year when his name appeared published in the business directory of the Almanac del Comercio. He died in 1915 in Lima as a result of the heart attack. While Deacon was the most prominent practitioner of homeopathy in Peru, his death did not indicate, indicate the disappearance of the practice. Doctor in the family, homeopathic kit and domestic medicine. In 1888, congressional debate regarding the proposal for regulating homeopathy by a special law, the representative, Mr. Chavez, argued it was absurd to talk about two different schools of medicine in Peru. In his mind, there, was, was, there were not a sufficient number of homeopaths. Quote, there is only one, and therefore, will we legislate on one inhabitant in Peru? Other congressmen follow the logic of doctors school of medicine, arguing that the medical knowledge could, could only be administered by, in the traditional doctor to patient relationship. They believe that without deacon practice, the days of homeopathy will be numbered. However, they underestimate homeopathic medicine's emphasis on self-treatment. While the School of Medicine embarked on a project to outlaw the practice of homeopathy, by the late 1880s, dozens of homeopathic products, mostly kits and books, have entered in Lima competitive medicinal marketplace. Thus, it's impossible to understand the relevance of homeopathy in Peru and other parts of the Americas if we do not consider the importance of cell and circulation of homeopathic products in the Peruvian and Limeño market. Homeopathy was a revolutionary therapy, therapy system that broke the traditional patient-doctor relationship. Homeopathic doctor didn't need to be physically present to make a diagnosis, as patients often mailed a letter describing their, their symptoms. Remote diagnosis reduced the cost of medical consultation and increased patient access to doctors. This model also allowed the therapy to expand beyond urban center to rural to rural areas where people had less access to physician but more access to mail. Furthermore, in a large number of cases, the presence of a physician was completely unnecessary in the process of healing. We don't know if the circulation and free sale of homeopathic remedies attain against the practice of homeopaths in Lima but in the few writings recovered from George Deacon, there is no, ma no mention or criticism of the free sale ho of homeopathic remedies in the country. Considering his opinion on the importance of expanding homeopathy in the world, we will believe that Deacon will come to the expansion of the homeopathic market. Books on domestic medicine employ simple language and provide instruction for preparing and consuming medicines. While during the first decade of the 19th century, homeopathy targeted the middle and upper classes family who could access to English, German, or French homeopath homeopathic literature, the eventual translation of classic work to Spanish opened up access to the monolingual public. Peru had a long tradition on books on domestic medicine. As historian Alan Warren has analyzed in colonial Peru, medical text, texts known as recetarios circulated between population with detailed instruction from homemade medical treatment and designed to be accessible to those lacking formal knowledge of medicine. Thus, homeopathic books were inserted in an existing in existent niche. Homeopathic kits included, included bottles to ready to use remedy for a specific ail ailment and the and companion manual providing step-by-step -step direction. In Peru, 
sorry. El Perú, the products of Hungary homeopathic medicine company received favor from the large public. Dr. Frederick Humphrey, the founder of the company, was born in New York in 1816 and graduated with a degree in Western medicine. In 1854, Humphrey released in a book what he called Humphrey Homeopathic Specific to provide, quote, remedy for every morbid condition which is proper for an amateur or family to treat and especially for all these diseases affecting suddenly. The following year, he founded the Humphrey Homeopathic Medicine Company, which soon became one of the largest homeopathic medicine houses in the world, with a capital of 500,000 and branches over all the continent. In his book, The Manual and the Mentor, Humphrey explained the healing system on his specific. Humphrey Homeopathic Medicine Company sold Spanish and English version of the manual in Peru as early 1890s. Peruvian learned to administer healing remedies prepared by a skillful physician. The cure improved people's health condition through, quote, less sickness, better health, better growth, longer a vigorous life. In 1888, El Perú Ilustrado regularly included ads for homeopathic products as well as articles explaining how the products work. People who wanted to acquire products of Humphrey and Company had to send a request by post to New York. The company would then send the products covering the cost of shipping, charging the same friends price around the world as they did in the United States. Following the commercial success of the Humphrey and Company, other business persons soon began selling homeopathic remedies in Lima. In, in 1902, Botica Inglesa, the oldest pharmacy in Lima and supplier of many pharmacies and drugstore in the country, announced in the Malaki del Comercio the sale of quote, a great variety of homeopathic remedies. As a consequence of this new wave of remedies, the Ministry of Industry, Trade, and the School of Medicine began to receive more patent requests of homeopathic products. For instance, in 1931, the English company J.S. Fry and Son Limited registered its product in Peru, Fry Homeopathic Cocoa. The, the ministry granted authorization for 10 years. It's interesting to note the complete absence of efforts to block on the part of the School of Medicine to the sale of homeopathic products in a legal open pharmacy by the, and by shipping. While in the minutes of the School of Medicine and documents, often reporting denunciation for illegal practice of medicine, the fight against homeopathy focused on the figure of deacon. And as a result, homeopathic texts and, and medicine were completely ignored. The main goal of the School of Medicine was to eliminate practitioners without a medical degree from the medical mar medicinal market. This can explain one member of the School of, uh, School of Medicine were so concerned with policy the practitioner of, of homeopathy like Deacon, but no concern at all with policing the dissemination of homeopathic products. Similar to the case of the United States, the School of Medicine did not raise any objection to homeopathic products, considered them inoffensive. As, his, as the historian James Horton state, from the allopathic viewpoint, the kids were the homeopaths Trojan horse a harmless, harmless appearing little box with remedies. When the remedies were chemically harmless, countless people benefited from doctoring themselves around the world, subsequently threatening the practice of professional doctors. As an advertisement indicated, homeopathy allowed a, quote, a saving for family that could preserve health without spending on visiting doctors. However, 
the greatest damage homeopathy was symbolic. During the second half of the 19th century, licensed doctors succeed in transforming medicine into a prestigious profession, alleging themselves with the state in the modernization of the country. Doctor became part of the Peruvian elite and preserved the prestige by requiring medical practitioners to be trained in official school of medicine. San Fernando's doctor, Simon Stanley, battled with an unlicensed practitioner and the deep root idea that medical degrees were less, less important than a successful cure. Homeopathy put previously exclusive medical knowledge within the reach of all literate patients. In conclusions, the homeopathic practice of Deacon and Lima reveals some relevant aspects highlighted through this presentation. First of all, the endurance presence of homeopathic in Peru, despite of its marginal position compared to other countries like Mexico or Brazil. Homeopathy, and particularly the presence of George Deacon in the, medi in the medicinal market, was a disruptive force that caused significant damage to the status of professional medicine, putting in question the monopoly of allopathy and the school of medicine's agenda. George Deacon's request to practice homeopathy without approval of the school of medicine generated heated debates between allopathic doctors in San Fernando and other members of the Peruvian society who support homeopathic treatment. Secondly, the, contradic the contradictory attitude to the school of medicine to persecute the practice of homeopathy while ignoring the cell of homeopathic medicine demonstrate an ambivalent attitude to professional doctor to allow or prohibit other medical knowledge. The anti-quack campaign targets practitioners perceived as real competitions to listen to doctor and unstable and charging category of the time. In the last decade of the 19th century, professional doctor targets pharmacies, Chinese herbalists, homeopaths, among others, to the main enemies of the public health. And finally, this practice has been completely ignored in the history of medicine in Peru. Although there are some limitations for the, for the very small number of historical sources. My research aims to be the first approach to understand the role of homeopathy in the country. Many questions still remain to be unanswered. For example, why the school of medicine persecuted strongly some medical practices like homeopathy while ignoring others such as the use of homemade remedies? Or was Deacon alone or were there another homeopaths in Peru in the 19th century? Who were they or who and who were their patients? We need to keep studying the complex relationship between Peruvian doctor with non-professional medical practitioner, including domestic and foreign. Thank you so much. Dr. Palma, thank you very much. What a wonderful talk. Thank you. thank you. So we have a couple of questions and I just would like to remind those who are watching, uh, if you do have a question, please use the live feedback button under the uh, live stream and those questions will come directly to me and I'm going to share them with the audience verbally and also share them with Dr. Palma in our chat uh, within the Zoom interface that we're using. So uh, Dr. Palma, the first question we have, I'll put it in the chat. Um, so thank you very much for this fascinating talk, uh, this individual writes in on a subject which as you rightly say, has received very limited attention. You noted that public opinion was part of the debate between Deacon and the, and the allopaths, and that many people preferred alternative medicines, homeopathic or otherwise, over uh, 19th century Western uh, allopathic medicine. The question is, did Deacon make any effort to incorporate the traditional indigenous medicine of Peru in his practice, or did he stick exclusively to the homeopathic principles that he had learned in Ohio? Thank you so much for your question. Mm, 
uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, and then, sorry, we have very few sources, historical sources to know more about homeopathy and, and George Deacon. Uh, in the National Library of Medicine, you, you, <laughs> you have only three, the only three numbers available of the Journal of Homeopathy. And in the journal and in the other document that I present, I want to show you. Uh, okay, this, this is the, another document wrote by Dr. Deacon. Uh, George Deacon uh, focused more in the, in the Congress uh, fight about the legal status of homeopathy. And he was more, um, he has more concern about the, the role, what's happening with homeopathy in the US, in Europe, and even um, in other country of Latin America that would happen in Peru. So, I, in the three numbers of the news, in the sorry, in the magazine that I read of homeopathy, I couldn't find anything about other kind of medicine, indigenous or Chinese medicine. That's not the topic that I analyze. I study in Peru, um, so sorry, but I think didn't have any effort to incorporate other kind of uh, non-Western medicine. Um, to his practice. Thank you. Um, so another question we have is about the, the rarity or perhaps even the uniqueness of mm -hmm. this magazine. Could you speak to why the copies at the National Library of Medicine are likely the only copies, as you've mentioned? Yeah. Um, when I was doing my research in Peru for my, my dissertation, um, I, re I, I read in the Chronica Medica, the, the this allopathic journal of the School of Medicine, that Dr. Deacon published the, a new journal called the Homeopathy. Um, I, I tried for months maybe years trying to find some copies in, in Peruvian libraries. It was impossible in the National Library of Peru. And then I found in the National Library of Medicine in the United States, uh, you have uh, three numbers of these, this journal. Um, I have the copies, you have the copies, if you want to share with the public, if someone wants the PDF, I, 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 can, I can share. Of course, uh, this important source. Um, as I mentioned before, the most part of the, the, the journal was devoted to explain the homeopathy, explain the, the work of Hahnemann, and then um, the discussion uh, with, the, with the Congress. He reproduced all the discussion of uh, between 1880s until 1890s. So it's, it's a fantastic sort because, but it's more related to the administrative status of homeopathy than to the um, other local problems about public health. But you have my you have my email. I can share the my email is if someone want to the the PDF. I can send them. If, if you would like to share your email, you're welcome sure. to do that. Uh, uh, you can, you can um, uh, pop it up on the slide and uh, for people to yes. be in touch with you. Maybe I will go with the Palmer. Uh, Wonderful, that's great. So another question we have is this one, um, and it's related to uh, Heinemann. Do you know if present-day homeopaths Peru or elsewhere in Latin America still explicitly consider Heinemann as their main intellectual or professional ancestor, or if they acknowledge the influence of local traditions as importantly? And a related question is, does homeopathic practice or herbal remedy have a standing in Peru today? And thanks to those who sent in these questions. 
uh, I I need the, the I know the case of Chile and Peru, most, mostly, uh, with journals and discussion in 18th and 20th century about homeopathy in these both countries. Um, in general, the publication focused on the Hahnemann, not the, not the local influence of other traditions. Um, in one Chilean homeopathic journal, for instance, they reproduce part of this book, the, the most important, the, the book, I don't know, sorry, I don't remember the, the name is, yeah, the Organ of, of Medicine, that is the most important book for homeopath. And the local journal uh, magazine reproduces different part of this book or, and translate to the Spanish. Um, so, um, sadly, the, the local homeopath are more interested on, on, on the figure of Hahnemann than the, the local or, or the or other Latin American homeopaths. And, and about the present, the, um, I think in 1990s, uh, I don't know, three or four decades ago, the Peruvian Ministry of Health allowed legally the, um, the, the practice of homeopathy and control who can practice um, this medical knowledge. So it's in, while in other countries like Chile, uh, the government approved the practice in the, in the early decade of the 20th century. I think this is in Peru, in, there, in Peru it's more recent, but it, it's, I think it's not very common. Okay, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question we have is, is about Deacon specifically. Uh, did Deacon leave any diary or other personal documentation? And this person writes this because they noticed Yes, in this slide, I think that's what they're referring to, of course, is um, that you credit uh, what we assume is a, a relation of his with the photo. Yes, after that, first of all, I need to thank Maria Brogi for this wonderful picture. It's a family photo. Uh, she's the grand, granddaughter of George Deacon. After I published the, the, the paper in 2019, I got an email of Maria, uh, who she lived in the US, uh, told me uh, he was the, the great grandfather. And he, she explained me about some personal detail of his life. For example, uh, he was a uh, the son of American Marine and about the, um, his mother, but, um, but the family don't have any other kind of document. Uh, I, I, they don't have any diary or other kind of personal documentation. And it's very scary that the documentation, I, the sources available about Deacon in Peruvian libraries is more about the, the fight against the, the school of medicine and more about the, his medical practice than the personal life. So I, 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 I couldn't find the, the death certificate uh, in, um, in family search. So I couldn't know about when he died and the reason and I have a, 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 for instance have a confusion confusion about the num the number the name sorry the name of, of his parents because Maria uh, told me the name the mother was sorry was Cecilia Mojica but in the certificate say the name of the parents uh, was Doña Flora Taboada. Mm. Yeah, this is. Uh, uh, so sadly, we don't have more than documentation about Deacon. And I really appreciate the family of him to share this photo. 
it's it's wonderful, isn't it, when yeah. someone reads your work and yes, it's not, no. you know, when someone reads your work, period. Outside the academy. Outside the academy. Outside academia. <laughs> yes. Writes to you and expresses uh, such engagement. It's a and because new... I did a lot of work and research about Tikon for, I don't know, one, two years. I, I think very close to him. I, I When I couldn't see the family for the say, wow, this person have a face. He existed, was part of it was an important part of my academic life during two years. So I was very, very happy to get access to, to this kind of more personal um, sources of, for, for, for example, this one. Uh, we have the, the signature when he sent a copy of his book to the, uh, the, to the Marine Library in the United States. So for me, a historian, this kind of documents um, are, are precious. I, ca I can put a face of my sources, yeah. <laughs> understood, understood completely. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned your, your academic life. Uh, we have a, a final question. We have many questions that have come in. Thanking you. Thank, for you, so, thank you so much for your interest. You're welcome. Yes, to, to everyone. Thank you, of course. Um, we do have a final question. Um, what's next for you in your research on this fascinating subject? Several people have written in to ask. This was part of my dissertation um, that I finished in 2017. I'm working on my book, but I'm translated my dissertation to English to Spanish. So it's taking a little bit, a little bit more time than I saw in the beginning. Um, this was one of my cases study about the medical pluralism in Peru. Other part of my research are focused on Chinese medicine. Another, it's, it's, it's amazing the story of Chinese medicine in this Indian country. Um, because it was very similar. It's like how the school of medicine in the end of the 19th century in Peru tried to um, eradicate any competitions. It's not only Peru, it was part of a process of modernization of the medicine in Latin, Latin American countries in 19th century and 20th century. Um, I use Peru as case of study. So in, specifically in the case of homeopathy, it's very difficult to expand the topic because really I, I spent two, almost two years of my life to document this, uh, to do this research. Maybe in the, in the future, we can move to another part of the country. But um, I found some very small group of Span Spaniard homeopaths in Arequipa, in, in the south of Peru, but in the 1930s. So they are like a small island in, in the country during, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, but yeah, um, if some young historian, Peruvian historian, are in, interested in this topic, please, I can help help them and um, give some sources I have in order to expand this amazing topic. So I'm trying to move to another non-Western. Um, therapies in Peru, and now my, my, my research interest moved to the relationship between migration and health. So this I think, especially during the epidemic time, how during epidemic time, we, we used to blame the immigrant, like it's happened today, it happened 100 years ago in Peru and Chile and other Latin American countries. So I'm trying to, to do the, the connection between both topics. Wonderful. Well, uh, with regard to um, others being in touch with you about your research, sure. both this Please. research, all other aspects of your research and your future research, we sincerely hope that um, many of those watching will be in touch and those who will watch the archive video stream uh, which will be available in a couple of days. We'll learn about you and your work and be in touch. 
uh, as well as be in touch with us here at the National Library of Medicine, as we're always happy to, to be in touch with researchers who uh, are using our collection. So Dr. Palma, thank you very much for your fascinating wow. talk today. Great to meet you, great to be in touch. Thank you so much for the invitation. And people remember the National Library of Medicine has thousands, hundreds of material beyond the US use it, especially during in this time of pandemic, uh, digital resources are fantastic. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. Have a great mm -hmm. evening where you, you are. Too.